Now this past holiday season, it was a big one for moviegoers, and uh, most significantly for fans of one of the greatest franchises in movie history, they were thrilled that finally, after decades of waiting, Hollywood would finally put out a movie sequel to revive this much-loved franchise. Fans have been waiting for decades, where they would, you know, where they'd finally see another movie, where they'd bring back those favorite characters, and we would relive the the action of the heroic life and death struggles, and 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 we'd continue the epic story that we had grown to love. And, and better yet, when this movie came out. Everyone agreed that this time they got the sequel right. There had been some others done, but they just missed the, the whole spirit and, uh, you, know, you know, kind of the whole connection to the old and the originals. And uh, however, this time they got it right. Now, anybody who's a movie buff knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, it, it's, what we're talking about is that they finally brought back the great characters of Charlie Brown and Snoopy and the gang into the, to the Peanuts movie. And uh, so they finally revived it, and it's exciting. Now, somebody might be saying, wait a second, you had me there. I, I, you had me there, but when you talked about the life and death struggles and heroic actions, and th th this doesn't seem like the Peanuts movie. Well, if that's what you're thinking, you obviously haven't seen the movie because you don't know that what's more exciting than Snoopy fighting the Red Baron. I mean, that's heroic. And so, so we have these, this great thing. And they say, now, why are you talking about this? Well, it actually got me thinking that it is a revival of the old Peanuts theme, and this year was also the celebration of what is considered by most to be the best known, most loved of all the Peanuts movie, and that's the, the Charlie Brown Christmas. And uh, it was first released in 1965, and so this year was the 50th anniversary of this, the, you know, the production of this short movie. And, and to celebrate its impact, ABC had a, special, a Christmas special talking about the Charlie Brown Christmas. And, uh, and in that, they had all kinds of famous people that came and that talked about it or kind of relived certain things, including the Obamas. President and Mrs. Obama taped a special tribute, which aired during the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And in their tribute, uh, Mrs. Obama said this, for a half century, people of all ages have gathered around the TV to watch Charlie Brown, Lucy, Linus, and the rest of the gang teach us the true meaning of Christmas. And President Obama then chimed in to help us remind us what Charlie Brown and Lucy and Linus had taught us about the true meaning of Christmas. He continued, they teach us that tiny trees need just a little love, and that on this holiday we celebrate peace on earth and goodwill toward all. And then Mrs. Obama added, saying, because Linus knows that's what Christmas is all about. Now, it might be just me, but as I thought about that, I'm thinking, I, I, I remember that a little differently. You know, I think about that great speech where Linus talks about the true meaning of Christmas, and, and I don't remember him talking about trees needing love is the meaning of Christmas. And so we think about it, what was it that Linus said was the true meaning of Christmas? Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That's a very simple message, much loved. And you look at that and you say, Linus got it right. So why is it that President and Mrs. Obama decided to go on a special celebrating that show and specifically referred to Linus's speech, but then took out any mention of Jesus, which was the speech was all about, but instead said that Linus taught that Christmas is about loving little trees. 
Now, I don't want to be too hard on the Obamas because they're not alone in this kind of a problem. There are countless people. Let's take just Christmas. There are countless people, countless TV shows, movies that, that are out there that talk about the meaning of Christmas and they're trying to say it's not about gifts, but then they say the true meaning about Christmas is about loving our family or about being generous or about something other than Jesus Christ. And, it, and as I thought about it, it caused me to think, can you really discover the meaning of Christmas without Christ? Can you have Christmas without Christ? And it's not only that. You see, each Easter, there are churches that claim to be Christian churches throughout the country who celebrate the meaning of Easter, meanwhile denying the fact that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. How can you have Easter without the resurrection? And not only that, there are at this time numerous churches you know, that are out there and they're influenced by this call that, that we want to be unified with all different religions. And so you've got all these churches and because we don't want to offend anyone, well, we won't talk about Jesus. We'll go to the common denominator. We'll talk, we all believe in the same God. Now, you know what? When I think of Muslims and Christianity, we don't believe in the same God. Because I believe in a Trinity God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And, and they deny that. They're putting people to death for believing what I believe. That's not the same God. But there are churches that are out there now that they find that the whole idea of the cross and blood is offensive. And so there are churches that are in their hymnals, are, there's hymnals that are being written that say, okay, we're going to take out any, any songs that talk about blood. Or we're going to go to people and say, let's change the words and take out the blood because that's offensive. Well, can you have Christianity without the cross? Can you have Christianity? Can you get to God and have spirituality apart from Christ? You see, there's are huge questions that, that they're not just, they're just not new, they're, they're old ones. Yes, Jesus Christ offends people, I understand that. But does that mean that as Christians that we should go out there and try not to offend people and not talk about Jesus and not talk about the cross, or in doing so, do we actually give into that, that, you know, that pressure and compromise the very nature of what we believe? Can you have Christmas without Christ? Can you have you know, Easter without the resurrection? Can you have Christianity without the cross? Can you connect to God except through Jesus Christ? See, again, this isn't new. This is something that Paul was dealing with in his day. As we start this whole series now in Colossians, what we're going to find is that the book of Colossians was written to a church in the city of Colossae, and, and it was written specifically dealing with this subject. There were people in that church that were saying, you know, well, we believe in Jesus, but you got to do something else. Or, or let's downplay Jesus. Let's just really talk about connecting to God. And, and this whole book is written saying, you need to understand that Jesus is central. It's a book about Jesus Christ, about who he was, about what he did, and about how knowing that is something that should transform us. Before we dive into it, let me just do a brief moment of introduction. It is written to this, uh, the church in the city of Colossae. It's known in modern day, you know, uh, Turkey is where it's at now. It was called Asia Minor at that time. And, uh, and it wasn't one of the bigger cities. It actually was a city that had been larger, but the big city in the area, the kind of the capital was the city of Ephesus. Now we'll come back and you'll see why this is important later. So there's Ephesus, and about 100 miles inland, there's Colossae. There's the, you know, the city that, there, that he is here. And what's interesting as we read about this, we find that this is one of the few churches that Paul is writing to that he didn't found. In fact, he had never even been there. For example, um, you, know, you look at this, it's not only because we don't have record of him going there in Acts. He actually, in this letter, talks about the fact that he had not been there. Look at verse 4. We heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have for the saints. It's not that I know it, it's I've heard about it. Where he goes back in chapter 2 and he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those we have, have not seen me face to face. I've never met you before, but I've heard about your faith. And here he is writing to a church that he himself didn't found, that he didn't know. And he said, okay, now why is he writing to this church? Where did this church come from and what is his connection? Most people agree that where it comes from, to understand that, you've got to go to the book of Acts in chapter 19. In chapter 19, it talks about his ministry in the city of Ephesus, which we saw just a moment ago. It's about 100 miles uh, you know, right there on the coast, the major city. And in chapter 19 of Acts, we read this, that he was there in, in Ephesus. He's trying to minister. And it says, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, 
speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with them, reasoning daily in the hall of Ty- Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So here's what happens. He's in there, there's opposition, and because there's opposition, he says, well, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to leave the, the synagogue. I'm going to go set up my own little, you know, shop. I'm going to basically set up a church, a seminary, and I'm going to, you know, be teaching every day and invite people to come and listen and to learn. And it wasn't just a seminary where we're teaching dry theology. He's teaching the truths about Jesus Christ, the truths about the gospel. People came, they were changed. And as people were changed, they took the things that changed them, and they then took that out and shared it with other people. And as you read the book of Colossae, what you find is there's one guy in particular, a guy named uh, Epaphras, who was there and listened. And this guy, Epaphras, then took what he had been taught and took it over to Colossae, 100 miles away, and actually a couple other cities right around there, started churches. And now this guy, Epaphras, who had started these churches, had been impacted, now is going back to Paul and saying, Paul's in prison. Paul, I want to encourage you, but I also need some advice. Boy, there's all these things going on in the church. There's all these people, and they're teaching things, and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to take away the emphasis on Jesus because they don't want to offend the people that come from Jewish backgrounds or different backgrounds. And so Paul writes this letter. There are a couple things to see even in that context. One of the things is when you look at this and you read what it said here, that here he taught for two years, he never left Ephesus, but what happened is that everybody else went out, and so we're told over two years that all the residents of Asia um, heard the word of the Lord. So you look at from this little city of Ephesus, that whole area of that map, reaching out 100 miles around, including Colossae, heard the word of the Lord. That's multiplication. And what it's telling us is something that was true then, is true even now. You know how God grows the church? It's not that we try to do a good job and get more people to come in here. It's that we come and we hear and we are, and, you know, are changed by what we hear. And then we go out and we share it with people. We share it with others. See, the gospel is something that's not about, well, we set up the church and we hope people find us. It's that we hear and then we go out as missionaries. And the work of the church starts as we leave because we then take these truths, we share it with other people, we pray for people, you know, we look for those opportunities, we celebrate the fact that, you know, 75 baptisms, why is that happening? Because people are talking about their faith, not just here, they're talking about it with people in their workplaces, with people in their neighborhoods, with people in their schools. And you know what? God took it and he expanded the gospel so it reached that whole region. And now what if we were faithful? You know, what could God do over the course of years, over a course of a decade, just by a group, a small group saying, God, I want to take that and I want to be faithful. How will he impact greater Akron area? Are we willing to let him use us? And so here you have this church that now has been established and the lead pastor there, Paul's in prison and he wants to encourage Paul, but he also says, okay, Paul, I need some insight. So he goes and visits Paul and this letter is the letter back where he says, okay, now here's the problem. We know from the context, you know, people are getting away from Jesus. And he writes this letter, and the whole focus of the book is this. The focus is on Jesus Christ and our identity in him, and who Jesus Christ was, what he did, and understanding that not only theologically in our head, but then putting that into our heart and recognizing that if we understand him and then have a relationship with him, that that relationship should totally transform us. Paul's teaching us that you cannot have Christianity without Christ. There is no meaning to Easter apart from the resurrection. There is no Christmas apart from Christ. And you cannot have a relationship with God apart through Jesus Christ. The book is all about Jesus. It's not just dry theology, but it's taking these ideas and it's saying, understand who Jesus is, reflect on that, and apply it to your life. Because if you understand how to apply that to your life, it will totally transform who you are. In fact, let's just briefly look at a couple other passages because you see that he's taking these ideas and he's saying these are applicable. This isn't just, you know, something that's, you know, mental knowledge. This is stuff that should transform us. Chapter 2, verse 2. In their hearts that they may be encouraged, being knit together by love, to reach all the riches uh, riches of the full assurance of the knowledge and understanding of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom had hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, you see what it's saying? That if you understand Jesus Christ, if you understand who he is and what he did, the result is you'll be encouraged. You'll be encouraged. 
You have a different perspective on life. You have an endurance in the midst of the difficulties of life. And not only that, but it's going to teach you to love people. You're going to discover love in a new way that you haven't had before. And then you're going to have an assurance, a confidence in life. It wanted to unlock the door of, of understanding treasures in life that you don't understand now. That's, that's some pretty good stuff. This is pretty important. He continues on. Verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That's where we get this, you know, this series title for these next first two chapters. Rooted in him, rooted in Christ. And what's it saying is that if we understand this, the goal is that it's not just that we have greater knowledge, but it changes literally the way that we view life. We become rooted, we become established. All of us agree that in our life, we live in a time of uncertainty. Personally, things go on, you know, things, surprises, crises, relationally, in our health, in the world. And I don't know about you, but I can feel pretty unsteady in uncertain times. And we long for, for certainty. We long for, for, for stability. What we need is, we can't change the uncertainty of the times. What we need is a foundation. We need to be rooted. And what he's saying is that if you understand who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for you, you're going to be rooted in him so that you're going to have a foundation that would be strong so that even when the world around you is crumbling, even when there's uncertainty, if you're rooted in him, you're going to be secure. It doesn't make life easier. It doesn't change the circumstances of life. It changes you so that you can deal with the circumstances in a radically different way. This is important stuff. Verse 13, he continues, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all, all our trespasses. So he continues, he's saying this, that when we understand Jesus Christ and apply that to our lives, Jesus makes us alive. In the past couple of years, you know, one of the real popular themes in TV shows and movies has been, it's, a, this, you know, it's really an old idea, kind of revived, it's probably the wrong word using the, the term, uh, terminology here, it's the idea of, of zombies. Um, and I don't know if you've followed any of these things, but probably the best known is the show The Walking Dead. And uh, I mean, it's, the whole idea is that you have people that die and there's some kind of disease and they come back to life. And, and usually, you know, when the person is dead, the real person has died and he just is, you know, walking dead flesh. And all he's doing is he's walking around. He has an appetite. And he's mindlessly going around trying to feed that appetite on whatever flesh it can find. Now, what Paul is saying here is that spiritually, apart from Christ, and it's not only here, it's throughout the Bible, spiritually, apart from Christ, we're, we're like spiritual zombies. That we were dead in our sins. That we're walking through life, but we're dead in our sins. Now, we don't know that we're dead. We think that we're alive because we're moving. But what we don't realize is that we're totally driven by somehow something, trying to, to feed those appetites. All that I know is I have a need. I have a need to be loved. I have a need for significance. I have a need. So I'm going from one thing to another to another, trying to somehow feed the appetite, hoping that that's going to satisfy me. I'm not really living. I'm just trying to survive. And he said, we don't know that, but apart from Christ, we're spiritual zombies. And he said, that's who we were. But when we asked for forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, Jesus came so that when we were now made alive, that we're not just following our appetites, that we're somehow now finding real life. We're finding the ability to pursue joy and fulfillment and significance like we never could before. Paul continues this in chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. See, when we understand this, we're made alive. The old us, the zombie us is killed and the new us is made alive. And from chapter 3 through on, if you're going to see it throughout there, what he does is he takes all these ideas and he says, okay, now let's apply it to every aspect of life. Because if you do so, literally every aspect of life is now made alive. You're not just walking through life somehow trying to somehow satisfy these appetites. But that, you, that you're alive in a way that you couldn't have ever been before. So do you want real life? Not just going through life trying to fulfill the appetite. You want real life? It's only found in Jesus Christ. That was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. 
And so it says we can find it. Now, in case anybody thinks this is a story, Paul says, no, it's not a story because I'm a living example. And he starts off by now giving us an example that transformed identity of somebody who was dead, who's made alive. And it's himself. Look at how he starts the letter in verse 1. He introduces himself, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. He calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ, a chosen one, a messenger. Paul had given his life to share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Even now, again, as he's writing this, because he's so committed to it, he has been arrested, he has been in prison for a couple years, but it's still what drives him. But he had not always been an apostle of Jesus. In fact, by Paul's own words, by earlier in his life, he had not only been an, not an apostle, he had been an enemy. He had been a persecutor of the church. In Acts chapter 26, I'm going to show you this in Paul's own words. He's standing before a guy named King Agrippa for trial. He's now being, he's been arrested for sharing the gospel, and he now starts his defense. And look what he says in his own words about his own life and who he was. Acts chapter 26, verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He says, that's, I was totally committed to opposing him. And here, I want to ask you a question. Do you have a friend, do you have a loved one, a family member who's not a Christian? Someone who seems so hostile to the gospel that you thought, boy, they're never going to come to Christ. Somebody that you think, boy, I have to pray for him. You know, I don't know if I, I, I'm discouraged even thinking of praying. You know, my husband will never come to Christ. My child will never turn their life over to Christ. My friend, my boss, you know, they're so hostile. They would never believe. I could never see that happening. You've never met someone so opposed to Christianity. Well, let me ask you, is he any more opposed to Christianity than this man was? Is he any less likely to come to Christ than Paul was? Someone whose whole life was committed to opposing. Look at how he describes it, verse 10. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but they, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to the foreign cities. You know, so I'm out there, I'm hunting people. My life was committed to this, to imprisoning, to putting people to death. That's his story. But that's not the end of his story because then he continues on. And then King Agrippa, something happened. I met Jesus. Jesus, better yet, Jesus met me. I was going and I was hostile and Jesus Christ came and he met me. And as he met me, he changed my life because you can't meet Jesus and not be changed. And he met, he met Jesus and God changed him because he's, he's met him. He surrendered his heart to Jesus. And he went from the angry man who hated Jesus and was persecuting the church to a man who now commits his life to now sharing the message of the gospel with others and is willing to be persecuted himself. Now, if God can do that in Paul's life, why can't he do it in someone else's life? When we go to the week of prayer, who are those people that you're praying for? You know what? Some of us, some of, we have those people that we, man, this person never come to, they have come to Christ. Write those down. Put it as a week of praise because we need to be encouraged. But, but that's why we do the week of prayer because God's going to do more miracles this week. He's going to do more miracles, and do you believe it? Are you going to persevere? Because if God could change his life, then he can change anybody's. It also calls us to question, do you have that testimony? Has your life been changed? Because when you look at that and you say, that's what happens. You cannot meet Jesus Christ and not be changed. You cannot have a relationship with him and not be transformed. Paul's a living example of that. Have you been transformed? He continues on and he challenges us about our own life. And he says, okay, if, you're for, if you've met Christ, if you have a relationship with him, then you are different. Look at verse, verse 2. He addresses this letter to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae. And when we look at this, we've got to realize that, that he's not just writing to a handful of people at Colossae. He's writing to them all. And so if we read it today in our terms, he's saying, okay, now this is written out to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Akron. That's all of us. That's everyone here. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's all of us. He's talking about a new identity we have, a new positional identity in Christ. And how does he describe us? That we're saints and faithful. The word translated saint here is, 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 you know, the, is literally the word holy in plural. It literally is, we are holy ones. And it's usually translated saints. Now, I don't know about you, but I was raised you know, as a child, Roman Catholic, and, and I had an idea of what saint was. And according to that view, I'm, I'm, you, know, you know, you guys ain't a saint and I'm not a saint. You know, we're a long way away from it. And so you look at this and you say, 
We're saints and holy. That's Paul, that's God, under God's word, saying that we're a saint. What does it mean to be a saint? If he says that we're saints, that we're holy ones, what does that mean? Because clearly it means something different than I was taught in the Catholic Church. See, the, the, the main idea is not one that's ethical. It doesn't mean that we don't ever sin, that we do perfect things, that we can work miracles, that type of thing. Literally, it, a holy one means holy means to be separated, to be set apart. We are ones that are set apart, ones that are separated. So, for example, you know, sometimes people will talk about the church as a holy place. It's not like these bricks and mortar and this carpet are somehow you know, made ethically pure or you know, they've been dashed with holy water and they're somehow different in their essence. No, it's a place that has been set apart for the purpose of worship of God. The Bible, it's not like the, the paper there is somehow special or unique. It, it's no, this is a book that is set apart because it talks about God. It's different than all other books. So to be holy means to be set apart. A Christian is holy. Not because we're you know, ethically perfect and we never sin and we never mess up. No, it's we have been set apart from the world to serve God. We are saints. We are holy ones. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a saint. That's, that's not my opinion. That's God's opinion. Whether you believe it or not, that's who you are. We are called to be saints and holy ones, not because we're distinguished from other people by what we do, by our own efforts, by our own spiritual qualities that we somehow got it all right, but we are called to be saints and holy ones. We are set apart from God because we are in Christ. We are saints and faithful in Christ. It's not what we do. You might think, I don't act like a saint. I know I'm not a saint. You know, if, you, if, if you knew what I was thinking last night, you wouldn't be calling me a saint. Yeah. That whole idea is that you're saying a saint is defined by the idea that you earn it. And you don't earn it. It's not you are a saint because you are faithful. You're a saint and faithful one because you are in Christ. And what he's saying is this. Because of your relationship with him, if you have a relationship with God, you have been set apart. You have been set apart from sin. You have been saved from sin and you have been set apart for him. You have been set apart for a holy life, for a distinct life. You have been set apart to serve him. That's who you are. That's a reality of who you are, whether you think it or not. If you think, well, that's not who I am. Well, you're disagreeing with God because that's what God says about who you are. The Bible says that you have been set apart. You have been set apart from your sin. You've been saved to honoring him. And now the question is, will you believe it and will you live up to it? Part of the problem is when we think, I'm not a saint, I'm just a sinner. And then we live like a sinner because that's what we think we are. If we understand, no, I am a saint. And it's not that I somehow act like a saint and then become it. No, I am made a saint. And if I understand it, then I become what God has already made me. Do you believe that? That's our identity in him. And so if you have any question, then he goes back and he says, understand the basis of that identity. Who are we and how do we get there? Look what he continues on. The basis and effect of our identity is at the very end here because he ends at the very greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. And you say, okay, what, what are you getting there? It all links to what he's being said. He, he's giving a greeting. Yeah, it's just a greeting. You know, the general greeting at that time would, was they would have gen, said karin, which is just a form of grace. It's actually from the same root that we get greetings. It's the same idea, but Paul doesn't use the word that they would have used in, in general greeting in that culture. He goes from karin and he takes a very specific terminology and he changes it to charis, to grace. You didn't greet each other with grace. That wasn't a greeting at that time. So he says, I'm going to greet you with grace, and not only that, but with peace, with shalom, the Hebrew idea. And, and shalom is not necessarily an absence of warfare. It's not something that you have an absence of problem. Shalom means that, is that we have a peace in the presence of God. That in the midst of everything that's going on, that, that there's a peace that transcends. And when he's teaching us, he's saying a couple things. How is it that we have grace and peace? It's all because we are in Christ. Because we are in Christ, we stand therefore as holy. We're saints. Not because anything that we've done, but because we have grace. So in Christ, made holy because we stand in his grace. We can never earn it. It's a free gift given through the work of Jesus Christ. It's a grace that then results in that peace. To help you understand it, let me put it a little differently. What is grace? Grace is God's provision for the Christian life. See, the whole Christian life isn't about, well, you need to do this. You need to become holy. You need to try to live up to the standard and then God will accept you. The Christian life is you cannot do it. That's why Jesus Christ came. 
He came to do that what we could not do. I'm a sinner and I would, I'm dead in my sin. I couldn't make myself alive. So Jesus Christ came and he died for our sin and he offers me grace. He offers me his provision, the thing that I couldn't do. So when I agree with him, God, I'm a sinner. I, I need your forgiveness. He provides that for me. But then as I come to know that grace, he then gives me peace. And peace is the enjoyment of those provisions. So God gives me grace, and then as I understand that grace, and I get that relationship with him, then I suddenly enjoy what he's given me. It's the ability to live in peace. See, peace is the assurance of reconciliation with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Only God can provide grace and peace. And what we have to realize is that there's a link here. See, grace always has to come before peace. Do you want peace in your life? You will never know peace until you know grace. The only people who ever find peace are those who first find grace. That's vital for us to realize. If you're looking for peace in your life, you know, we go through Christmas and people talk about peace and joy and and all these ideas. You will never find the product to give you peace. You will never find the relationship to give you peace. If, you th- if you're struggling in your marriage and you're, you know, somehow and it's like, oh man, it's, I married the wrong person. No, it's your sinfulness as well as theirs. No, no relationship with another person will ever bring you that inner peace. You will never find anything to ultimately bring you peace apart from the one thing that, it, the one answer that there is, and that's a relationship with God. Because peace cannot be bought, it cannot be accomplished, it cannot be earned in any way, it can only be given. And it's only given through God. And the only way that we can ever discover that peace is to acknowledge that we don't have it and we can't get it on our own, and that we need it by God's grace. That we can't do it apart from Him. We need Him to do it for us. To acknowledge that need. Actually, we started off talking about Christmas. Let me go back to the close on a Christmas theme. One of the most misquoted passages in the Bible is actually misquoted by the Obamas in that, that, that thing that we talked about with Charlie Brown Christmas. Luke 2.14. What did the angel say to the shepherds when Jesus was born? I think if I ask 100 people, they're going to say, you know, that, that Jesus came to bring peace and goodwill to all men or to earth. That's not what it says. Look at what it says. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. He didn't come to bring peace to everyone. He came to bring peace among whom he's pleased, among whom know his favor, literally among whom know his grace. Now here you have the angels proclaiming Jesus' birth. He came to bring peace on earth. And that peace is only for those who know his grace. Now all of us, we long for peace. We need peace in the depth of our heart. No matter what you're going through, we need that peace, that that satisfaction. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't have it. And the lack of peace with each other and ourselves is ultimately linked to a lack of peace with God. We're not at peace with God because we're sinners. And whether we, and we try to deny it, but deep down we all know that, that apart from God we are sinners. And that there's something wrong in our relationship with God. We can't fix that on our own. Jesus Christ came to bring peace. But it's not a peace that everybody knows. It's not a peace that's peace in you know, a lack of war on the, internationally. It's a peace to each one of us individually. And the only way that we will ever know that peace, the only way that we will ever know the blessings that that comes is to recognize that I will only know peace as I know his grace. I will only know that relationship where I'm made right with God if I know his grace. And so I I, I close in asking you, do you know his peace? We all long for it. Do you know the peace of God? And if you're, you're struggling and you long for that, I want you to realize that Jesus Christ came to bring you peace. And it's an offer that he makes to each one of us here today. He offers peace. Not the lack of problems, but a peace that, transforms, or that transcends them. But we will only know peace if we first of all know grace. Do you know his peace? If you don't know his peace, have you ever, have you ever received his grace? Have you ever come and said, Jesus Christ, I acknowledge that that I I need you. I can't do it on my own. I ask you to forgive me through what you did on the cross through Jesus Christ. Receive his gift of grace. And as you receive his gift of grace, he will make peace 
between you and God. And as you discover what it means to live at peace between you and God, you will discover a peace in the depth of your soul that transcends human understanding. You will discover a peace in other relationships that teach you to love other people like you can't imagine now. And for those of us that have done that, what do we do? We say then, okay, now my identity has to be, it's not just something I did one time, but I am rooted in Christ so that my identity should become increasingly Jesus Christ and what he did for me. And the more that I understand that, the more I understand his grace and what he has done, the more I apply that to my life, the more I discover what it means to live in peace. A peace that transforms who I am and every, every relationship I have and how I view every aspect of the world around me. Do you know that peace? Do you know that grace? He invites each one of us to, to it this morning as we learn what it means to live a life that's rooted in Jesus Christ.